Well, she shares a great deal about, uh, you know, she's not from Philly. She's sort of a country gal from West Virginia. You know, and she's very, very open and very, very honest and very, very straightforward. And, and uh, so she tells a lot about herself, about uh, her life and the things she went through and overcoming the terrible illness she's had and things like that, giving out advice and um, on people who, or especially women who may have problems and things, or may, may have medical problems. And life, she has two sons who are now grown. You know, I mean, they're grown men. They're 30 years old and older now. And uh, I know when, when they were little boys. And uh, that's about all I will start out with. And I will, I'm gonna interview, talk to Lisa for about 25, 30 minutes and just let her talk about her book and let her uh, talk about why she did it, what's in there, what she thinks is important. <laughs> And I'll try to move the conversation along. Then we'll open up the questions. We'll let the young lady have the first question. I'm sure yeah, she's fine. curious, and uh, we'll let her talk and uh, things like that. And so, again, Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. I'll ask the first question. Is that all right with everybody else? Yeah. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good. Lisa, uh, why did you write the book? And let's start with the basic question. Why did you write this book? and share things so, so uh, intimately and things like that. What made you want to tell it? You, you well, Vern, um, I actually had never planned to write a book. I, um, when I retired, I had been ill. And I had been um, on medical leave from Channel 6 for almost three years. I had returned after I had a bone marrow transplant from my illness. We finally figured it out. And so seven, eight years after that bone marrow transplant, I realized that my disease, my illness was resurfacing. It was returning. And I knew I was going to have another bone marrow transplant. And so I figured this is probably going to be a chapter that needs to close and I'll start a new one. And I, I thought I would do something. I thought that God might lead me in the right direction as to what I would do, but I didn't really plan it. My younger son, who might be here in a few minutes, kept bugging me to write a book. And he had always been one of those children who really wanted to help and really wanted to give back. And he is in a job now where he gives back. He's at um, AmeriHealth Caritas. And, HMO facility down by the airport. And he loves to work with a nonprofit in the community and, and at, at, at some schools and helping young people who maybe don't have the same resources that he had growing up. And I, as a mother, thought he just thought it was cool to write a book. And I would tell Leland, I don't really want to write a book. One day he sat down with me and he said, Mom, do you understand how many people you could help? And I thought about it from a different perspective. And he happened to be going to school with a young boy named Billy Tierney. His dad's a big marketing executive in the city. He used to um, be uh, in charge of the, the, the Daily News, the chief editor, Brian Tierney. And he had his dad call me and say, Lisa, why aren't you listening to Leland? You really need to write a book. I think it would be well received. And he had lined me up with a, a publisher. And I thought about it, and it, part of the reason I, I had not planned to write a book is I wasn't sure I wanted to revisit all of that stuff that was so hard and, and frightening to me. I didn't know if I wanted to go back there, but actually it was very therapeutic, I found. Mm -hmm. And I started writing. Um, it wasn't easy at first because there's a difference in writing for television and writing for print. And I had a young, um, I had a, a, an elderly woman actually. Uh, Stan Hoffman was a well-known sports. Hoffman. The Hoffman. Thank Hoffman. you. Thank you, Hoffman. Uh, well-known sports reporter for the Inky, for the Inquirer. And his wife and his daughter write for the Inquirer. She writes for uh, the sciences. And she helped me, you know, make that transition from writing for television to writing for a book. And I'd go over to her house in the afternoon. She lives sort of close to me. And 
we would we would uh, have like a little workshop. But once I met the publisher and got going and got a feel for how I wanted to write it, it just flowed, and it and it was very helpful to me to be, revisit those areas that were painful, and to find out they weren't so painful anymore. So it, it was um, there was a deadline by that time. That was a little tough because I had it, I had pages spread all over my living room, and I had taken my time for a year. And then all of a sudden, this publisher says. I think it was April when I met him and he wanted it done by June. So I was like cramming for a test. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it came out okay. I was a couple of weeks wait, late, but, but it worked out all right. The, the story is interesting because uh, <clears throat> Lisa grew up small town in West Virginia. She had three brothers, so she was always pretty protected. You had three brothers around mm -hmm. who are wholesome guys. You're pretty protected. But she actually worked very hard to get where she got to. She worked in TV while she was still in college and uh, spent a lot of time and a lot of hours. And there's a lot of performance art there. It's a little bit more difficult, far more difficult than just getting up there and starting to talk. And uh, even then, the climate had not matured for women especially. For young women, it was better, but for women in general, it was still, it was very much a man's dictated world. So she had to endure that, endure that through college mm -hmm. and, um, and start moving around uh, to different towns. She was in Nashville where Oprah Winfrey was her, uh, all that's in the book, you can read yeah. that. You know, Oprah Winfrey was, and they were at the same station. And, and it's an experience, you know, because you're away from your home and you're, trying to survive, and you're not making much money despite all the glamour and things like that. Right. And then she moved to Philadelphia. But tell me about coming to Philadelphia. The journey? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you know, I, I won a, a small scholarship to go to college because it was a West Virginia State College right across the street from me. It was an all-black school. And I, didn't, I wanted the college experience. I, I didn't want to be living at home and walking across the street to college. So I wanted to go to Marshall, where I would have an experience in a dormitory with a roommate. And so I applied for a journalism scholarship and got it. And they paid for the first semester. So I went to Marshall and really, really liked it there and thrived. But my money ran out and I needed a job. And an upperclassman, I still tell him I... I'm indebted to him today because he told me about a job for a weather girl at the local NBC affiliate. And he knew I was coming to school and majoring in print media. He knew this was I, in Charleston. This was in Huntington. Huntington, West Virginia. Right, about an hour's drive from my house, an institute. And um, so I, I, I went down and tried out for the job. I needed a job. I was working at the glass, the glass plant, Owens Glass Plant. And I didn't want to stay there, so I went down and... What were you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were carrying some of my sores and I were carrying glass off the assembly line until they made us secretaries. We did that for a semester. <laughs> so I was doing anything I had to do. But uh, I got this weather job. I went down and they said, we, you, do you know the 50 states? Do you know the low pressure system and the high pressure system? And I said, yeah, sure I do. And you, you know, it wasn't anything like a meteorologist today. You were a weather girl. And so I did that weekend weather job um, throughout my college years just to make money and to help stay in school. And when I came out of college, well, I guess that the last semester, my senior year, I asked to do news. I didn't think I'd want to do weather. So I said they needed an intern for news. And I asked them to, for the internship. And since I was already there, they said, fine. They, they gave me a little 36 millimeter camera and the keys to the news van and told me to go find some news. <laughs> so I, I went around the community and tried to do stories and thought of good feature type stories. You didn't start any fires or anything. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> The sto one story I was most proud of and got the most praise for was I did this two-part series on the wa wastewater treatment plant in Huntington. And I got a lot of praise from Boz Johnson, who was well known in the industry. 
But when I graduated, <coughs> the FCC at <coughs> that time, the Federal Communications Commission, was cracking down on stations to hire uh, uh, women, women and minorities. Yes. I was a double minority. I was mm -hmm. black, I was a woman, I was in the right place at the right time, so I had about 12 offers. And I, Lord knows why, but I chose Oklahoma City. <laughs> Because they paid the most money, $14,000 a year. Wow. Which, was, which was great money for a city that size. Yeah, and, uh, 1976. Yeah. And I went out to Oklahoma, hated it, but I, I learned a lot. I didn't really love the city. Um, it was flat and it was bare and it was nothing like my green mountains and wonderful hills in West Virginia. Wild, wonderful West Virginia. But I stayed eight months. And then I got a call from a station in, in Nashville, WTVF. I still remember the call letters, and the news director was Chris Clark. And um, <clears throat> I was excited because I was coming from the 45th market to the 33rd market. So it was a nice jump. And I remember the night that I had my inter the night before I had my interview, I was sitting on the, hot on the edge of the bed in the hotel room. And I turned on the news just to see what their news was like and who was angry. And I see this black woman anchoring the news at the solo. I had never, ever seen that before. 1976. And I remember thinking what a presence she had. You know, how her diction and her confidence and her poise. And I said, wow, I sure hope I meet her tomorrow when I uh, go to the station. So I go to the station, the secretary escorts me outside Chris Clark's office and I see this young woman over in the corner. Immediately I get up to, to, to compliment her and as I'm coming toward her, she says, well, aren't you a tall drink of water? <coughs> and I know right then that she's my kind of people. She's friendly and outgoing. And I said, I'm Lisa Howard and I just really liked you on the news last night. And she says, hi, I'm Oprah Winfrey. And we were both 19 years old. Wow. We were both born in 1954. And I ended up staying at her apartment that night, and she shared with me that if I got the job in Nashville, she probably wouldn't be there because she was vying for a position as a co-anchor in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Jay-Z, WJZ. And sure enough, when I got the job and came, she had just left two weeks prior to go to WJZ in Baltimore. And we, we had trade exchange numbers and kept in touch. And um, she didn't like Baltimore too much. The guy that she anchored with didn't appreciate having a co-anchor. Didn't want to work with a woman. And certainly didn't want to work with a black well, woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we kept in touch and um, I remember I loved Nashville. My mother had gone to Fisk and there was Meharry and, uh, excuse me, um, Meharry and the Grand Ole Opry and just so many cultural and wonderful things to do. I made good friends. But after two years, a call came from Philadelphia. Yeah. You remember Joe Hunter? Yeah, sure. Joe Hunter sure. was, um, what was he, a talent scout? Well, right? he, was, he did a lot of recruiting for the station. He traveled around yeah. the country and he did different TV Sales and look for talent on the air, things like that. He was actually a former newspaper man. He worked at the Tribune for many years, and then he oh, worked right. at um, he worked at the Enquirer for a while too. But right. he had a job. He'd go and set up in a hotel, watch a tape recorder, and watch people with a portable tape recorder. They're telling very primitive by today's standards, <laughs> but uh, and he would set up and, and hire people. You know and. and get tapes of people and come back and show them to the station. We had a very uh, powerful uh, and actually very sharp general ma president general manager then, Larry Polly. He's passed away just recently. Yeah. But uh, they would look for talent. They get, they, you can assemble hundreds of uh, tapes out there. And, and, what, and what Lisa's talking about, it's a very high powered, even then it was a high powered, very pressurized business with a lot of competitors. Maybe there's a hundred people out there looking for one job, you know, or right. two or three jobs. So you had to, and it's very subjective, you know. I, I, I've, uh, you know, most of the jobs you go for, you get turned down for it. But I'll let you go ahead. Finally, you got the call from Philadelphia. Though. Yeah. Don't let me and stop talking. That's okay. And um, 
I, I was so excited because I remember I was at the 33rd market in market size and this Philly was number four. And I said, whoa, I never thought I'd make a jump like that. And remember, folks, out in the Midwest, Philadelphia and New York are the same thing. Right. You know, right. It, it, uh, <laughs> the folks way out right. there, they're the same place. I thought, well. I thought I was coming to the big city like New York. and So I'd go up and I'd, I'd do my audition. And then when I come back to Nashville, I hear from Joe. And he says, they really like you. He said, there's just one little problem. He said, we have a Mark Howard. And... They, the, the news director thinks it might be confusing if you are Lisa Howard. Would you have a problem changing your name? And I said, no. I had no idea what I'd change it to. I said, no. And then I did, ended up taking my mother's maiden name. So I became Lisa Thomas. And I came to Philadelphia. I had never anchored. And they were hiring me to do the new news and report. I didn't have any problem with the reporting part because I loved that and I had done that, but I had not anchored. They put me with the, the right guy though. Thank God they put me with Jim O'Brien. Remember him? Mm -hmm. Put me with Jim O'Brien and he was doing everything. He was working 24-7, yeah. dialing for dollars, he did yeah. the weather on every newscast, he did the news. But he was, he took me under his wing yeah. because they were on my case for six months. They didn't like my Appalachian accent. They, my hair was too big. You know, I was messing up. I was mispronouncing words. I couldn't pronounce Concha Hawken and <laughs> Bala Kenwood. He was a no mean. He was a no mean. Right. And Phil. Phil yeah. They were on my case. <laughs> So Jim one day, Jim said, look, do we stop listening to them in the, in the way, only way, only the way Jim could say, blank them. He said, I mean it, blank them, start focusing on the, what you're doing. He said, we'll, we'll practice together. So I brought in a whole list of, you know, boroughs and, and districts and cities and he practiced with me. And I got all those pronunciations down and gained some confidence on the anchor desk. And um, I really started, you know, began to thrive. And people thought of him as the wacky weatherman because he was so funny, you know. But he probably cared more than anybody about our success and the success of the people there, I think. He was very serious about the station and that we were loyal. Um, yeah. And so, when 1983 rolled around, I was just five years later. You can imagine how stunned and devastated we all were when we learned that Jim had died in a parachuting accident, mm -hmm. a skydiving accident. The thing about it, he used to walk around and demean anybody who wouldn't go up there and jump with him. Right. Yeah. And I said, look, man, I'm not jumping out of an airplane <laughs> unless it's about to crash. I think right. the heck with that. And, but he used to always... She was a real mm -hmm. macho guy from Texas, and he used to <laughs> yeah. wanted, wanted people to. Two of my best friends, were, Louis Lozada, and two of my best friends were going to go with him one day. Really? Said, like I said, man, I'm not jumping out of a plane <laughs> unless it's yeah. imminent that it's about to go. Only choice. And um, but yeah, and, so. you know, he had an unfortunate incident where his parachute became entangled in another parachutists and um, I, we were just all devastated. We gravitated toward the station and you know we were like a family so it, it was pretty hard. I would, I would realize that that would be a watershed moment for me because I took on his duties pretty much. I began to do the news with Mark Howard that where he was co-anchor and I began to host some of the parades that he used to host. Dave Roberts took over the weather that, that um, he did. And I was thriving at Channel 6. For the next 20 years I had met, um, Vernon had introduced me to this wonderful doctor up and coming. And we, <laughs> we had married and had kids. It was a blind date, it was so funny. He, he set us up on a blind date down at the Mushaloo. Mm -hmm. And I was an hour late. <laughs> and, and, and he was a young, ambitious, young intern, doctor and internist. And, right. uh, 
This is way before cell phones. <laughs> and he said, well, are you coming down there? For I said, man, I'm not going to be anywhere near that. Talking out of school, I had introduced him to some woman I knew. He went to some medical convention out in California. And I said, there's a, there's a woman out there I know. You ought to look her up and say hello to her. She's a nice lady. Well, he, we were, anyway, he, it didn't work out too well. I never, I, I never went out, so he was sort of mad about that. He might have been a little, little bit leery this time. But he was a real, he was a real stickler for time. And, yeah. uh, Lisa's, and Lisa's not, you know, and it's just, uh, but this is way before cell phones, folks, yeah. 1980, and he kept calling, I was at home watching the ball game by that time, and he kept, listen, man, and he worked all day, he was right in the middle of his work day, so he never caught her on television, he had no idea what her yeah. personality was like, things like, he said, listen, man, this woman hasn't shown up yet, well, are you sure she's coming? I said, yeah, man, she's, uh, she's very reliable and very, very nice person, just sit tight. So this is about three phone calls later. I'm trying to watch the Sixers game. <laughs> and that was back when Dr. J was here and everybody right, else. Maurice, and I'm trying to eat some Chinese food and things like that. <laughs> and then, um, I had had to do a live shot the last yeah. minute. So I was very apologetic, but we really hit it off. Well, on the fourth phone call, he said, oh, maybe, maybe this is her. Maybe, he said, okay, let me go. And it was, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, we really hit it off, and I guess a little more than a year later, we got engaged, and so my life was really, really nice, you know, the job was nice, everything was, his practice was growing, and in 20-some years, um, it was, it was, it was 2001, I was at the height of my career, I was in the best health, you know, I was working out, taking my boys to school, and I'd work out with the trainer, and we'd power walk around the neighborhood. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, I started to feel the strange symptoms, and my feet and legs tingling. And after a couple of weeks, you know, I ignored it a little bit at first, thinking it would go away, and, and then stabbing sensations. And Bill, being a doctor, said, you know, he thought I needed to see an ENG and have a nerve conduction study, and I did. And it, we determined that I had lost about 33% of the strength in my lower legs. We didn't know why. Um, and one thing I sort of forget to tell people sometimes, uh, one of his mentors, you know him, at Jefferson, who used to be chief of neurology at Lankanoff, mm -hmm. Dr. Edgar Kenton. Mm -hmm. He recently passed away, yeah. suddenly. He took me to him, he's a black man, fiercely intelligent, just a, well, I knew his wife, his ex-wife I should say, and he did a few tests and told me the same day that he thought I had a real rare syndrome called POEMS, like a rhyming poem, it's an acronym, P for polyneuropathy, which I was feeling in my legs. The O was for organomegaly, uh, enlarged organs. I didn't have that symptom yet. E for the endocrine system, which I did have, where my skin was turning a strange grayish, sort of bluish color. The M was the blood that he had taken. He had taken blood for me. It wasn't an autoimmune disease. It was a, a plasma cell dyscrasia, a blood disorder. They called it a smoldering myeloma. And most of you, if you're normal and don't have any certain illness, have 250 to 400 platelets in your blood. I had 1.4 million. So my platelets were helter-skelter. I had developed, um, what is it, hypothyroidism. The S was for the, the funny color change. So poems, I hadn't heard of it, Bill hadn't heard of it. And the doctor, to his credit, admitted that he had only seen five cases in his career. And he was getting ready to leave like an go to Morehouse in Atlanta to do medical research. So he couldn't follow me as a physician. And he suggested that I go to another hematologist at Lankanal and to, um, to see a neurologist, a specialist, a, um, a specialist in this poem syndrome down at Johns Hopkins. So I did. Those two doctors followed his diagnosis for a couple of months, and then they put their heads together and decided they didn't think I had 
poems. They thought I had this autoimmune disease called CIDP. And it had to do chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So it basically was based on the polyneuropathy. They weren't seeing the full picture. I didn't know that at the time. We were in touch with um, Edgar via phone and we would talk to him, but it would be very hard for him to follow. They put me on a different treatment, um, which involved a blood cleansing treatment called poly, um, called plasmapheresis, and gave me steroids. And if any of you had steroids or you love someone who has, you know that mask the symptoms. So sometimes I felt like, yeah, yeah, this is making me feel better, I'm good. So were either of those, dying, were they, uh, something that was common for people who were tall, uh, uh, who were, you know, you're taller than the average woman, obviously, and I, I mean the average, but she was tall, and uh, was, was either, either one of those, no, they I weren't? I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember them, yeah. them us making that association, okay. but um, they were, the poems was much more common in African American women and Native American and Hispanic rather than Caucasian. Right. So anyway, they misdiagnosed, they changed my diagnosis and treated me for something I didn't have for about two and a half years until I got real, real sick and went to the Mayo Clinic. Another doctor advised me to go to the Mayo Clinic. Boy, if you've got something you can't figure out, that's the place to go. I told Those are two of the most renowned months. hospitals in the country. They're number one and number two, Ooh, really. Yes. So, you know, if you thought you were Hopkins, you thought you were okay. You yeah. Know, and, uh, yeah, really. The guy at Hopkins, and I tell people, you know, if you, you have to be an advocate for your own health care. Mm -hmm. Because I was at this wonderful hospital at Johns Hopkins, and this guy and I butted heads from day one. I just didn't care for him. And I, I, I didn't believe in him. Bill, Bill didn't know what to think, but the one reason I was against him was he would never talk to me. He would never give me eye contact. He would tell Bill everything. He'd turn, he, he would touch my hands and tap my knees and do his little examination, and then he would turn to Bill and tell me what he thought was going on. One day I just blew up, and I said, look, nothing's wrong with my ears, nothing's wrong with me, I'm still a pretty smart chick. I can understand what you're saying, and uh, but I was screaming. I was very uh, upset, and he turned him to Bill and said, "I think we'll order her some Zoloft." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Is I'm not depressed. Or, or, I'm pissed. Right. <laughs> so I left. I didn't go back to him. And I advise anybody: don't do that. Don't let somebody, unless they're listening and paying attention and really caring and showing that they care about your well-being. But it turns out he was wrong anyway. But that's very important psychologically to you. You're, yes. you're already scared to death right. and everything about else. And if you can't connect with this person, male or female. I uh, tell people, you know, yeah. get that third, fourth, fifth, sixth, what, how many opinions you need to get. But uh, a dear friend of ours who happened to be a gastroenteritis, I was having trouble with digestion. My vocal cord became paralyzed, so whatever was eating at my lining of my nerves and, 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 and damaging my legs and feet started to get go internal and paralyze my vocal cord and then paralyze the, paralyze the, vac the vagus nerve in my stomach. And that's when we got really scared. And this gentleman, who was the gastroenterologist, sent us to the Mayo Clinic, and that's, there was a lovely little Italian doctor who had written the standard of care for poem syndrome. She ran every test you could imagine for one week and that last day I was there Friday. I, we came in her office and she said you have poems. You have always had poems and it's shutting With the original down. diagnosis guy right. said. With the original the doctor. The brother who went to Atlanta. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. And of course, you know, at that point, you don't want to say, well, what's wrong with these doctors and why didn't they get it? You just want to know what's next, what can get me well. And she said, 
you know, it's shutting you down, but you need a bone marrow transplant. She said, the problem is you're too weak. She sent me home, gave me massive doses of chemotherapy, exercises over at Bryn Mawr Hospital to build up my pulmonary, my res respiratory. And she says, I want you to come back in a couple of months. Well, I was so religious doing that stuff. I came back before my 50th birthday. I came back in about a month and a week and had the bone marrow transplant and everything started to get better again. Mm -hmm. Yep. Except I did have some permanent damage in my legs and feet. I was in um, a wheelchair for a while and then leg braces. And I still, you know, have balance issues and um, some pain in the legs and, and mostly balance issues now. But um, it, was a, it was a real journey. And w w delicate question. What about people who do not have <laughs> access to the kind of resources you had? A, uh, a job with a great medical plan, uh, uh, yeah. a, a husband who understood everything that was being talked about, that's and getting right to the question. Mayo Clinic. I mean, where healthcare is a major issue in all of our lives, this day and past days and beyond. Right. What, what, did, what, did, what can you tell people who don't have all that was available to you, that you were fortunate to have, and what they should do and what they should be thinking at this point? Right. I thought of that often because when Bill was setting up his medical practice, I would work with him, you know. I, I would be in the office and he may have one or two patients and I would get to know these people, and some of them and their relatives are still his patients today. But I would think about that little lady, Mrs. Snyder in West Philly, and, and Mr. Turner in Southwest Philly. I, was, I said, how on earth would they get through all this paperwork? How on earth would they just get know who to ask for next? You might believe the first person who talks to you. And, and all I can say is just continue to ask questions. Get somebody to help you be an advocate. Because if you get a doctor to be an advocate for you, someone with medical credentials, they can call the Mayo Clinic and get you there. But that is one place where you don't have a good diagnosis that I would refer people to. And you just have to be your own advocate and just to continue to plug away and get to a person who will make those calls for you. They have places, I named some of them in the book, that will assist you with the paperwork, that will help you get through getting your disability. Because I found all that overwhelming, you know? And I thought, well, you know, I've had a good education. My husband is a doctor, for goodness sakes. He's asking the right questions, and we still got it wrong. It still almost took me three extra years to get it right. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, you know, I, um, when I talk about the pain, um, that same doctor who saved my life by telling me I needed a bone marrow transplant also prescribed me OxyContin for pain. And I remember asking her, I said, look, I have addiction in my family. My father was an alcoholic and so was his brother and some of his cousins. I said, I'm worried. I don't want to get addicted to this stuff, and that's what I've heard could happen. Oh, no, you will never have that problem. You will not have a problem with this. Don't even think twice about it. Well, I did become addicted. When I was getting better from the, from the um, um, bone marrow transplant, I didn't think about, I was so happy that I could speak again and project my voice and that it didn't have the vocal cord that was paralyzed. I was so thrilled that I could digest my food again and my stomach had healed and I could, my hands and arms were better. I still had the problems in my legs, but I was improving physically and I thought I was improving emotionally. Uh, but I was taking that OxyContin and I was sometimes abusing it. And it wasn't until my younger son, the one that got me to write the book, he was, uh, we were taking him down to the airport to visit his um, college roommate. He went to UVA, and he was a, a Spanish kid from Rio de Janeiro. And so he was on his, supposed to be on his way to Rio for carnival and to visit Carlos. We doing okay with time? Oh, yeah. And 
he missed the flight, gave us the wrong flight. So, you know, being the diligent mom, I called and found that there was a flight that we could drive to at Dulles Airport mm -hmm. outside of Washington. In Virginia. Yep. And mm, I wasn't, I didn't remember that I didn't have my evening dose of Oxycontin. Wow. I was planning to go back home, just, you know, 20 minute drive from the airport. So we went down there and on the way back, I started having withdrawal symptoms. Mm. I started shivering and I made Bill stop the car and I rolled up in the back seat with a blanket and he knew exactly what was happening. And I mean, he put the child safety locks on because I was threatening to <laughs> jump out the car. It was the most horrible experience I've had. And, uh, that I can think of. How did you break out of it? I, when we got home, I checked myself into rehab. Wow. And I went for three weeks and um, went back up to the Mayo Clinic because I didn't know anywhere else to go. I know there were local places. But I went back up there and got a real education hmm. in, in drug dependency, what can happen to you. And it's funny, there were 11 of us. And it ranged from this little 16-year-old girl who had become addicted to Percocet because she broke her leg playing soccer, to this guy. This he was the you know the group clown who had been in four times, and his wife had given him an ultimatum that he better get clean or she was leaving with the kids. And I remember he came up to me and he said, "What you in for?" And I said, "You make it sound like a prison." He said, "Well, what what you in for?" I said, "I oxycodone." I, wanted to know how many I was taking, how, what the dose was, and I said, I'm taking a, you know, 80 milligram. And he said, oh, that's nothing, I'd take 120. Like he was bragging. And then he asked me if I ever chewed him. He said, you can get a better high that way. So, you know, it ran the gamut of people's experiences with this drug, and I really learned so much. I learned that I could control my pain with um, meditation. And that's what I was taking it for. But when I looked back at it, I should have seen it. But this woman, years later, Dr. D, we call her, her name is Dr. Dispensieri. I brought it up to her and she apologized to me because she said, you know, a lot of us weren't aware how common, mm -hmm. you know, the addiction is. And uh, I said, I knew you were thinking I'm an educated woman. I'm a TV anchor woman. My husband's a doctor. There's no way I'm gonna get addicted. And now she knows better. And, and these are the, that, that uh, Oxycontin is what the opiate that's yeah. destroying uh, so, so many, many lives, lives today. And uh, um, Percocet, Stab, Yeah, Percocet. that, that dr uh, prescription drugs leads a lot of people into that. Uh, yeah, it, because when they can't get the prescription anymore, they go to heroin. You know, they, right. It's cheap on the street. Question, uh, uh, did you want to talk some more about that? No, no, no. In addition to the physical ravages and all the nerves and all the things you've fallen into, maybe I wish you'd probably enlighten people, including me, how you were able to deal with all of this psychologically. Where, what was this doing to your head in addition to the physical problems? How did, you, how did your head deal with it? I mean, you you were here and then, boom, man, you, uh, the whole world came up with smacks you in the face, you know, yeah. and, and things like that. And um, you know, how did you deal with it? I, I, you know, I, I would, you know, you can be friends with somebody, but you know, you don't like to, you didn't call me that often, so I didn't call you. I mean, I was thinking about you, but I, I, I you know, I don't like to impose on other people's situations. So I sort of stood back and when I'd hear from them, I would talk to them right. on the phone, but you know, how did you deal with it? I mean, you're, I mean, you're tied up, you're caught up in your house, yeah. going to the doctor, your son's leaving college for a while to come home and help take care of you, because he just, uh, yeah. and um, it, it, how did you, how did you have the mental strength to deal with it? That, that'd be my you know, question. I think that's Rob something. Rob Jennings, Rob Jennings yeah. asked me once, he says, uh, you know, they say that uh, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle, but he said, I know if I, I couldn't have handled that. He said, I know I couldn't have done that. Right. And I, I said, you'd be surprised. You'd really be surprised how resilient you can be. Mm -hmm. And you know, faith. My mother grew up Catholic. Mm -hmm. And we all were forced to go to Catholic school, and me and my three brothers. 
and catechism and you know, I had my first communion. None of us followed Catholicism. But she laid that foundation for us that there's something greater than you out there and that there's something to believe mm. in. And you know, I, I think of uh, James Baldwin's book, The Evidence of Things Not Seen. Faith is the epistle to, was the epistle to the Hebrews. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And I just, I always had faith. I never thought I was gonna die, even though I learned later that some of my closest relatives weren't so sure. This guy called me on the phone one day, and I know I wasn't good at, at sharing this at some, at one stage I, I didn't call out a lot. And you're in tears on the phone, and I, it dawned on me, what am I doing to my friends? I'm not explaining to them I was out a long time, and he was very emotional, and it touched me, and yeah. I wanted him to know that I'm going to be okay. I couldn't understand. I said, well, Vernon, I'm not dead, and, but, but I was close to it and wouldn't believe it. I, I had developed that rapport with Oprah, and she had her 25th anniversary show, and I was still out. I hadn't come back, and she had asked. You know, where's Lisa? And I think they had shared with her my story. And she said, Well, is she well enough to come up and do my 25th anniversary show? And I was recovering from the bone marrow transplant. So I wasn't horrible. I wasn't at the, my lowest depths. But I wasn't supposed to travel. But oh, I wanted to go to that show so bad. <laughs> so they sent um, John Morris with me. They said, mm -hmm. Go send John Morris. And if your doctor says you can go, we'd love for you to cover this. So I went up and John took good care of me and I was so excited just to get back into the fray, you know. And I remember when I had gone before, she, Oprah would have the top reporters from the top cities come, LA, New York, Chicago, and I always, she always let me go first. So I went last and I was like, I wonder why I'm last. And so everybody had like 10 or 15 minutes. I guess I was out there 45 minutes because after I interviewed Oprah, she interviewed me for a segment she was doing on, on the show, on a later show. And in, in the process of interviewing me, she said, I just couldn't believe it when I heard that you had a bone marrow transplant. And I said, yeah, I sure did. And she asked the question that no one else had asked me. She said, did you think you were going to die? And I said, no, never. I look back at that interview now, and I say it with such confidence, like, no, never. And that's when I realized that I had this faith. My mother traveled everywhere with me on these trips because Bill had to hold down the fort at home. Leland was still in high school. And I, I realized then why I never thought. I really thought God had another plan for me. And uh, I really thought of James Baldwin's book, you know, Faith, the Evidence of Things Not Seen. And I always had faith. Um, I remember I felt pretty bad sometimes, and the thought it's not that the thought didn't cross my mind, will I be here tomorrow? Hmm. But for the most part, I said, I don't know how, but I'm going to get through this. But I know it was faith. But do you still, do you find yourself to be deeply religious now? No. That's what I, that's what I was going to ask. Not, right? I'm, You're not a... I'm not a regular church goer. I like to visit churches. Um, one of my sons is, is more religious, Langston. You know, he's just had my first grandchild. It reminds me of this little one there. <laughs> and um, so they have a church and they go, and I go with them sometimes. But I don't always go. Mm -hmm. But... I have strong faith. Even now, after, you know, right. God and faith right. pulls you through. That's, that's, I, yeah, that's so I, interesting. I pray and I live a life that I think God would want me to live. And yeah. I think this is part of my yeah. sharing my story, helping others, you know, answering questions about what do you do when something like this happens. Because I sure was one that never thought it would happen. Mm. You know, I was... Um, I was in the best of health, never hardly had a cold, but um, you, you'd be surprised how resilient you could be when something strikes you. You fight back instinctively. 
And if you have a strong faith, you hold on to that. You had a whole family. You had two sons. You were still raising and a husband. A lot of people don't have that kind of uh, support. Under, support and undergirding to fall back on. That's Many important. people don't. That's important. And uh, that, that was important too, the family's faith and the family's uh, um, uh, to be there for, yeah. you know? And friends, you know, if you, if you don't have a large family circle, friends can mean a lot. And um, two of my girlfriends came up to the hospital when I had the first and the second. A bone marrow transplant because if um, if you don't have someone there with you you have to stay in the hospital the whole time otherwise they have facilities uh, leading from the hospital or ho a hotel room or a bed and breakfast where you can stay it's a, it's really an outpatient procedure um, um, some don't realize but the bone marrow transplant you're not in the hospital the whole time as long as you have a caregiver with you and people ask me, I know we're going to open, I forgot, I realized I forgot my watch, what time is it burn? It's, I think people are still very interested in what you're saying. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't see anybody sitting back there saying... No, I'll right. open it up. I, I'd, I'd love to have time to open it up to your questions, but there's, there's, I just, um, um, I was going to say, you know, bone marrow transplants are, are not painful. You know, they're not like scraping bone marrow and digging into your back. These days, you have a bone marrow transplant. It's almost like a blood transfusion. They take the bone marrow from your blood and it wipes out everything. Don't get me wrong, you are weak. I was the weakest I've ever been. It takes about two months for you to even begin feeling normal again. And it takes almost a six months to a year for full recovery. Um, and I have to have all my shots again. I had to have a polio and wow. yeah, measles, and measles, and, 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 wow. measles, mumps, rubella, everything. It wipes your slate clean. Wow. So you stay there because I could go outside after about the fourth week, the first month, I could wear a mask and I could go right. across the street and get a little ice cream or frozen yogurt. Because I couldn't go by, I could give you something. For right. Yeah, that's right. I remember that very so, well. you know, your immune system is just depleted. What, as you look back now, the time, it, all this time it took to get through this, all the years and yeah. things like that. My, uh, I remember one time, you were it was between the the uh, blood uh, transfusions, I think, mm -hmm. and we were down at the Thanksgiving Day Parade, mm -hmm. and. Uh, she was close to both of our children, and her, she and her husband were. And I remember, I didn't see you, but you saw me from a distance, from behind. Me and a woman were walking into a, one of the, you see the trailer set up down there, and, me, mm -hmm. and the woman walked in there. And later she came up, and I said, uh, and I turned around, and she said, fine. And my daughter turned around, and she said, oh my God, that's Corinne. I thought it was your wife, and it's my daughter, and she said, oh, and you, I remember you saying, I've lost so much time, and I, 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 I yeah. thought about that today, I've lost so much time, you know, my daughter gone from, when I became ill, his daughter was a little girl with little pigtails, and then when I saw her that afternoon, she was, you know, well into her right. teenage years, and was looking right. more, much more like a woman, so that's all, the, you know, that um, time, you were sorry, I never forgot that because you were yeah. stunned. And I thought about it. I said, Man, oh man. Yeah. You said, I've missed so much in time. It's, uh, I reflected on that many times, you know. That. Right. But you put things into perspective, you know. It does make you view the world different, differently. Um, it makes you realize just how precious life is. You know, I was a real A type personality, everything had to be in its place. and when the boys were little and they they applaud me now because I'm, I'm not afraid to let the house get a little messy. I don't have to pick up everything, you know, and uh, everything doesn't have to be in order. And, you know, you, you learn that you really need to believe in yourself as well as be an advocate, you know. When, when storms come up in your life, they're not always to cause disruption and chaos. Sometimes they're Sometimes they come to clear your path. Um, but I do see life differently, a different perspective now. 
Anybody want it? Is that, that's enough. I always have 50 questions. For <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have questions, questions out there you want to ask? Yes, sir. Yes. First of all, thank you all for being here. This is great. Thank you, Mark. Um, how has news changed? How has news oh. changed? <laughs> Since the time I left for all this, or just well, from, from, from the start to the time you left to now, yeah. Let me tell you, <laughs> the big change when I came back. Don't make us sick, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna get sick. When I me. came back, I guess it was close to 2007, and I had I became ill in 2001, and I tried to come back. I think I came back two months, mm -hmm. and then I my ver my my. Um, my vocal cord, yeah, my larynx, became, my, a nerve in it became paralyzed and I had to leave. And, you know, we all had a certain way to do things. When I came back, it was right around the time of the economic collapse. Auto industry was plummeting. And that's our livelihood, you know, that feeds us money. Television. And, and we were losing viewers, viewers, viewership was down. And we were going toward Twitter and Instagram and yeah, like, the internet had come on. The and internet uh, was a big deal. We moved into a new building and we were going to get a whole new wave of people. Yeah. And they were telling us, what I remember after about the second year, it was 2008 going into 2009, we had a meeting and I remember Carla, our news director, saying, now look, when you go out on a story, you want to tweet what your story is going to be about and tell people where you're going. And then you want to come back, <coughs> tell them what newscast it's going to be on. Little, another little plug about your story. And I was barely able to get my story together. I was coming back and, you know, I'm a little, moving a little slow, walking a little slow. And I said, I'm not sure I want everybody to know where I am. <laughs> because it was 1990 that I had a crazy man come up in the parking lot and punch me in the face. Do I really want to tell people where I'm going to be? Nope. So that's part of the big change. You know, they want, uh, Twitter was important. Um, social media was really becoming big. And mm -hmm. it was, I had a hard time following it, I remember. <laughs> One day someone asked you if you had, you had done something with Twitter and you came over to me and said, what do I do here, what, how do I do this? <laughs> we, the veterans had a hard time with it. And I knew, I said, you know, I, I, gotta, I gotta check my, my finances and see if I can not retire <laughs> <laughs> I did not enjoy it at all. And, uh, but they were pushing it big time. And they still are more than That's, ever. Yeah. And, uh, my children have never, you know, when they when they started getting their cell phones and things like that, my daughter got one when she was 10. Yeah. And I said, well, what? And she says, well, she needs to be called if you can't pick her up or she has to stay late at school. Well, that was a good For safety's sake. Right? Her mother, it's for safety's sake. And, uh, you know, I still, they still have to help me a lot with things like that. And they say, Daddy, you're supposed to be so smart. I said, look, man, I was born in the 40s, you know, and I don't, uh, I didn't grow up with all this stuff, but that brings me to another thing about, you know, they used to always get on me because they said, why don't you write about your children? I said, man, I, you know, I can write about my children, my dog. You know, I've had threats over the telephone about stories. Yeah. I was doing things like that. Yeah. I get threatened on the street maybe twice a month by people I've been shot at from here to El Salvador, and I don't, I'm not, you know, man, I'm here to cover this story, not cover right. my life. I, I'll write a book one day and publish it after I'm gone, maybe, but I'm not, uh, right. and these guys don't understand that, and, you know, people, these things, this Facebook, that turned out to be crooked, as you know, that's turned out to be uh, less than wholesome, and all kind of stuff is going on with that stuff, and I said, man, I'm just not putting out where I am. You've had the, the newswoman shot down in, uh, live on TV down in Virginia by some of the guys. Yeah. We used to, that's the station where Amy Morris worked. Really? She knew the cameraman. She <coughs> really? Yes. I didn't and, know uh, that. So, do, all, do, you all, do you remember that story? Mm -hmm. woman was live early in the morning, she and her cameraman, and a disgruntled former colleague mm -hmm. 
shot him on a boat. Yeah. Yeah. Murdered a boat because he was mad because he lost his job. Right. And, uh, so you're constantly under a kind of threat. I've been shot at three or four times. The closest it came was down in Chester of all places. And, uh, you know, it, it, so you have all those dangers. You have any psycho. This guy walked up to her. Channel 6 used to be part of the community, man. I mean, we, for years we worked there. We knew the squirrels in the parking lot. And, you, know, walk, you know, people could cut through the parking lot. And we had a, an unarmed yeah. security a guy there named Freddie. And Freddie would, if somebody didn't, Freddie would say, hey man, beat it. You know, <laughs> things like that. But, but back, to, but we, we used to walk out and any talk. Kind of and, no, any kind of safety whatsoever. You could walk through there just like you were uh, coming from the Adam Smart Hotel. And one day she's walking out. Uh, with one of our one of our people, and, and suddenly this guy's walking towards her. And suddenly, he reaches out and 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 and, and takes and hits her, you know. And and uh, a former bodybuilder. Former bodybuilder, yeah. Wow. And when he knocked me out, I remember that I do share that in the book. Um, mm -hmm. Was with Scott Palmer. We we're just leaving work, talking casually. This guy had parked in our parking lot and waited for three hours. The, the unarmed guard uh, had told our news director that, oh, that car, yeah, that car was there since, you know, like 3 o'clock this afternoon. And then, I mean, he knocked me out. I was out for about three minutes. Scott is trying desperately to get me up because he drives around the parking lot, tires screeching, and tries to run us down. And he pulled me between other cars just in time. And, you know, the other, uh, Monica Malpass, some of the other women have had issues and have had to go to court over people. Just people aren't always stable. And you, ha you, know, you have to ask yourself, do stations have an obligation? When they put you out there, is easily accessible? You know, this is our friendly anchor woman who is coming into your living room, giving you the news. Very personal. And this guy thought you were talking to him personally. He thought yeah. I was talking to him when he cut his TV off. He was paranoid, schizophrenic, and stopped taking his medicine. And he shoplifted that day. And when he cut his TV off, he told the police that I was chastising him, reprimanding him for shoplifting. He was over at Epi and wasn't taking his medicine. So he came and sat there, and he came to shut me up. He said, I just wanted her to stop bothering me. So he punched me in the face. And, you know, it's a lesson because I think that less than a year before, I can't think of the state, it was somewhere out west, a woman had been followed home oh, yeah. by a deranged viewer who went up to her door and killed her, right. shot her. Wow. So Happens all the time. it took two years, but our station finally built a fence around mm -hmm. our property and had an electric gate and a 24-hour guard. You know, you can't get in unless you, unless you show ID or you've made prior arrangement. But it took two years to do that. And none of the stations were at security like that. Yeah. It's unfortunate. So you can, you can imagine our reluctance to just be telling everybody where we are. And so I would tell people the story I'm going to do and be sure to watch. But I would never say where I was going to be. Well, sometimes, you know, you would be put two and two together. <laughs> but the social media thing turned me off. And, you know, when, when viewership falls like that, we tend to get a little more sensational. You know, I, I would watch from the other end. I remember when I was sick with the first transplant. And I won't say what station I was watching, but... One of the anchor men on the local station, it was an anchor man, was reporting on um, an ice cream truck that had come into this neighborhood. And a child had darted out from two parked cars and gotten and, and been hit and killed. And he started the news, it was the big story of the day, and he started the story and he said, um, an incredible story from South Philadelphia. And I remember screaming, no, it's not an incredible story. It's a tragic story. Right. Right. A life has been lost. Some mother has lost her child. Father's lost his child. And I, I just, I looked at how he has sort of become 
Um, Inured to it, yeah. numb to the process. Numb to the, the, the fact that this was a human being, this was a little boy, because he had said it so many times, he had done the story. And I would catch myself sometimes as an anchor. I always liked reporting more than I did anchoring. But anchoring is where the money is, you know, that's, they pay you so much better. So you do that, but I would have to beg to go out and do a special or do a story. But I said, please don't ever, if I go back and anchor, please don't let me take these stories for granted. You'd be callous or remote yeah. in the field, yeah. And yeah. Um, you see the other side of it when you're, when you're away from it for so long. But then I started seeing the, the sensationalism and when I agreed to let Channel 10 do my story about the opi opioids. Um, Anzio Williams is their news director. And Anzio, Anzio and I were friends, and um, they were doing a long series on opioids, and Aaron Coleman did a wonderful job. But in the process of doing it, they had to promote it. So that when it came time, the week before the story was going to be on the air and they were promoting it, oh my God, I thought I'd made a mistake. They were like, Lisa Thomas Lori, long time TV anchor, is telling us her deep, dark secret. What She's that? never talked about this before. And I'm like, oh God, what have I done? And I was, you know, really worried about what they were going to project. What are they going to do? And she did a beautiful job. But that promotion, yeah. but that's what we do to get you to watch. Yeah. And it scared me to death. It's called hype. You know, H-Y-P-E, hype. -E, hype it. But so, I tell you, yeah. that next morning, Monica Malpass called me. And I thought I had received a call from you and a couple of Jim Gardner. He was upset because my station decided not to do that story. They I think they still thought a stigma is attached with opioids. And I wanted to be at that point, I'm ready to be transparent and authentic. And they didn't want to do it. So I'm retired now. My auntie wanted to do it. I, I thought it was important to do. And with all the doubts I had had over the promotion, the next morning Monica Malpass calls me. And she said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But our, do any of you remember our health reporter, Anita Brickman? Yes. She said Anita lost her son to opioids last night. They found his body in his college dorm. <laughs> I knew I had done the right thing. And, you know, we remember when that little boy was born. He was, uh, he used to come, she used to ring about a station, and he was a little Lord Fauntleroy, you know? <laughs> and she and her husband were, you know, he used to come by and he'd always have his little violin with him. And I'd say, well, yeah. uh, and her real name is Brick Manus, you know? And I said, well, well Mr. Brick Manus, why don't you favor us with a tune here? And he would take out and play. He was, he was coming along fine and he was doing well, had good parents, solid folks. Yeah. And, you know, I'll tell you one story if I may. Remember the guy who shot the, the two state policemen up in the Poconos, they ambushed them outside of the barracks up there. Well, I went up there to cover that story. I was up in the Poconos, and there was a, a police chief up there who had been a policeman in Philadelphia, and I knew him from the old days here. And he had taken his retirement money and gone back up to the Poconos and be to head his own 15-man department or 15-man and woman department, things like that. And I said, "Hey, man, so this is where you landed up here in the up here in the mountains, huh?" And he said, "Yeah." He said. Listen, man, we'll find this fool. He, he, he's not a danger to the public. He's just got it in for cops. And that's what we, that's what we have to be careful until we catch him. And he was a naturalist, a nature guy, and he can hide out there. He said, we'll catch him soon enough. He said, but let me tell you something, man. The real story up here, and this is five, six years ago now. He said, man, these, this heroin and these opioid derivatives, he, and he put it, he said, man, this is killing. He's he eating these white kids up here. Alive, man, alive. There's your real story. And sure enough, sure enough, it was in the heart of breaking all over Ohio and other places right. like that. It's, it's, it's that opiate, Oxycontin, and all the things they get into starting out with prescriptions. Right. And um, it, it, they can't handle it, man. And it used to, you know, it used to be heroin and cocaine things used to be their problem down there in the city, you know, and it was. Yeah, it used to be an urban issue. Urban issue. And now we see and that a black or Latino issue, to put it frankly. And now okay. suddenly all hell has gone to gone to uh, you know, all hell is broken loose among the people who matter or believe they matter even more. And now 
it's completely out of tr control because they didn't, you know, a lot of you are young here, but cocaine used to be very expensive and that was the, and heroin were the, were the uh, pleasures of the elite, the, the, the show business crowd. Yeah. And now suddenly it's out there and it's very inexpensive and it's killing, uh, it's killing kids like crazy and, uh, and, and, you know, Killing those who are not supposed to be, ever have these kind of problems, you know, right. show children, and uh, they get it out of their own parents' medicine cabinet. You know, Bobby was hooked, was was on uh, that for a while because he had yes, because he yeah. had tremendous pain. Oh, he was, a, he was a very accomplished doctor and lawyer. her husband's mentor, doctor and lawyer, and her actually her one of her husband's mentors. But he had to, but he was a very strong-willed guy, and he got out from under it once that pain subsided, things like right. that. And he, he did it, I'm sure, cold turkey. But those are the things we've got to watch in those trends you see out there. Right. Very One dangerous. of the reasons I decided to be so transparent in the book, because I didn't have my experience with um, OxyContin abuse in it initially. But my boys have seen three friends, close friends, one, one young man, uh, my younger son knew and was so close to us, I would tease him and call him our third son. They both went to Episcopal, and this little boy and um, his mother and I were very close. And he was just one of two other boys who have died in the last four years. Mm -hmm. So three that they either played sports with or knew very well have either taken their life or have mm -hmm. had overdosed because of opioids. <coughs> and um, I said, if I'm going to talk about all of this, I need to talk about all of this. Yeah, and you feel better that you put all of that out there. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yes. Yes. Um, actually, two questions. Sure. Uh, one, you talked about early on in your career that you were at the right place at the right time. And because they were hiring more African American women right. in the industry. Did it ever cross your mind that it was more. Did, of course, Excuse me. A question ever come up for you? Is it? Did you have the talent? Did you have the skill? Or was more right place at the right time? And did that ever sort of give you less confidence in yourself, or did that give you more? It didn't give me less confidence. Um, but I and I wasn't questioned about it ever. I didn't even think about it. I was always going to do whatever I had to do to be as good as I could. But I was questioned about it when I came to Channel 6, you know, affirmative action and should you be here. And uh, I won't say his name, but I, I shared an office before we moved into our new building with one of the reporters. And we would discuss all sorts of things. And he, um, he had an issue with why did I go as black when I was so light? He wondered out loud why I wouldn't it be easier for me to just say I was white, and we would get in these heated discussions. I said, "Why would I do that?" I said, "Who does that?" I said, "You're asking me to deny all of my ancestry." <laughs> I said, "You're wondering why I wouldn't do that." So he was trying to understand that, but I knew it came from um, not a bitter place. I knew it came from a real inquisitive place. He really didn't understand. You know who I should have offered. As soon as you tell me who it was, I'll, I'll make that decision. Yeah, he he said, Well, do you hate do you hate having that label of affirmative action over you? Or do you think you would have gotten a job anyway? And I said, I you know, I'm just glad I got a job. I I think I do my job pretty well. But I tell you. There's an interesting thing that Oprah and I kept secret for a long time. Oprah, I learned years after, had auditioned for the job in Philly and been rejected. Mm. The same job. The noon anchor job and reporting. And I used to be, I was designated the Oprah reporter because we had crossed paths and everyone knew I knew her. So whenever there was a story for, at Harpo or whatever Harpo was doing when Beloved, the movie she, she bought the rights to, and I would be the reporter that would go up to Harpo. So one day I was up there and she just in conversation said, 
Well, that's probably, she says, well, you know I was turned down for Philly. It wasn't meant for me to go to Philly. I didn't know. I said, what? She said, I went to interview for Philly two months before you did. I said, what? I never knew. So when she told me the circumstances, and I said, you never told me this. She said, I knew it wasn't where I was supposed to go. And as soon as I got to Chicago. And so I'm trying to digest this. And I, I, I said, you know why you were turned down, right? She said, oh, yeah, I'm glad you said it. She said, I'm glad you know. And I said, I know. <laughs> so we laughed about it. But when you think about Philadelphia's race relations mm -hmm. and history of racism, mm -hmm. <laughs> you think about it. My station and many stations, like my station, were concerned, very worried, when the FCC was cracking down on stations to hire minorities. They had a wonderful audience that liked the white men that were giving them the news. They were very reluctant to introduce anyone of color for fear that the ratings would drop. Mm -hmm. So when Joe Hunter, the uh, talent scout, found me, I'm light-skinned. You know, people might wonder what I am, back then especially. And so, you know, I get this job. Now, I have never anchored in my life. Oprah was solo anchoring in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So you ask yourself, and she and I knew that with my light skin, the audience would not be threatened in the eyes of management. They wouldn't have to worry. But it worked both ways because I told over and she, and she wasn't surprised. I said, well, you know, I tried to get a job before Philly at W, is it Jay-Z in DC? Yeah. JLA? JLA. I went down to audition for a job at JLA in Washington, D.C., and didn't get it. And one of the executive producers, they said, you know, when they hire somebody here, they want them, people to know they have a black person. That's what I was about to, that's what I was about to say. Uh, it depends so on the management and their frame of mind. Because, but uh, Philly was a yeah. known racist city. You yeah. remember when uh, Major League Baseball? Mm -hmm. So they knew their audience, you know, their audience in South Philadelphia, they were, and they did. When I came, I would say 90% of my black viewers knew I was black. Yeah. I would yeah. get letters from black the Italian black community. They, they knew I was black. I got letters from the from the Italians in South Philly. I got them from Asians. Yeah. We're having a bet. Are you are you black? Are you white? Or what what are you? <laughs> so they would ask me. They would write and ask me. But the most popular anchor woman in Atlanta, for example, is uh, Monica Kaufman. Yeah, she's a Negro's Negro, man. Yeah. I mean, there's no mistake in what she looks like right. and who she is. So it depends on different managements right. and what they're looking for and what they think will best suit them. Yes. You know, that doesn't exist in large part everywhere. anymore, or everywhere anymore, and that has changed, things like that. Oh yeah, I look at our, 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 um, our reporters and anchors now, I mean, that's something we wouldn't see back in our day. Which is another it's question. wonderful to see, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, um, okay, so when you first came to Channel 6 in 1978, is that correct? Eight, uh-huh, 78. Okay, and uh, so you was the first black news anchor woman in Philadelphia to anchor the news? I wasn't. No. no. Beverly Williams was at Channel 3. Oh, no, Channel Edie Edie Huggins was reporting at Channel 10. Orion was here. Orion Reed. Who is the lady who still has a show? I, I met her my first week here. Trudy Haynes. Trudy Haynes. I did a story with um, the girl that did The Wiz. I just saw her do something with Teddy Pendergrass on Facebook. And Trudy had come here from Detroit. she has been here a long time. Yeah. She came from Detroit. Trudy was very nice to me. She, We became very close after I met her. Well, okay, wait, were you the first black news anchor woman on Channel 6? Yes. I don't know about so, that. Oh, wait a minute. No, there was another no. black. <laughs> oh. Somebody. But I don't think you remember her. There. No, there was somebody who was there for like two months or something. Yeah, she was I there. She, she went to California. I, I met her one time. Yeah. Okay, so. But I was the first long term, long time black anchor, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the question know. I want to ask is so did you, did you feel any kind of pressure, you know, being by that you was the 
first long term black like, news anchor woman at Channel 6? No, I, I didn't feel any pressure because of my race. I felt pressure because I had never anchored before. I, <laughs> okay. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I wasn't sure what I was doing. But uh, no, I didn't. I, I just felt I needed to correct some things and get a handle on, you know, my confidence level. In things like that, there's always pressure left unsaid. I mean, right. in, in any profession, really. I've had black female doctors who I've known for a long time. They call hell at the University of Pennsylvania trying to get through medical school. Does Barack right. Obama get treated better than a bum like Trump? Yeah, yeah there, there's always heat on him. And there's always an excuse for Trump by a lot of people, not yeah. not these days. But so there's always an added pressure or a, a double standard of expectation of behavior that exists there all the time. And um, you know, yeah. it, it, that's always there, whether it's subtle or unsubtle. Uh, one time, um, if I may interject, one time there was a guy who was a reporter at, one, at another station in town, at Channel Ten, this was many years ago. He had developed, well, I'll tell you, one time the general manager of Channel 6 called me down. I'd just been there a few weeks. He said, Vernon, uh, you're doing a good job. Uh, is there a problem that we can help you with? Are you having some problems that we might be able to help you with? I said, yeah, I could use more money. You could help that patient. <laughs> could, you could solve a lot. He said, no. He said, what's the story? I mean, are you okay? I said, yeah, man, I'm fine. The news director was sitting there, and so was the president. I said, no, I'm fine, man. Uh, and everything's cool. I said, well, okay, well, let us know if there's a problem. Joe Hunter, who was sort of the, the, the highest black official at the station, said, look, man, they, they had gotten word, they would gotten phone calls that some black reporter at one of the stations was closing down every bar on City Line Avenue every night, <laughs> getting drunk and skunk and getting carried out. <laughs> Excuse me. It's not me, man. <laughs> But Joe Hunter, they never told me exactly what was going on. And it turned out to be another guy who I knew. And he worked at another station. Okay. And of course, you know, they saw you know, <laughs> two black men, it must be one of them. So right. they, they just called me. And they had called the station telling them I was out there getting blasted every night. And getting carried out of every bar face down. But that's something, I mean, those are things you're going to have to deal with. And, yeah. and uh, it's incredible. And it's a, but. You know, you're dealing with an audience, which is, you know, you got smart people, dumb people, you got every kind of person out there, and, uh, you know, we all look alike, and it, it was a, it was that kind of thing. So they had me, they were, you know, they thought I, I was the one with the problem, and it was another guy with the problem, you know, and... Um, was there a question right here? I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yes. You just spoke a little bit about it, um, anchors and emotion, like you're not expected on time. You don't always have opportunity to show emotion while you're anchoring. So I want to know what story touched you the most personally uh, over your career. Uh, I still think of it today. I was in, Ash in Nashville and I was reporting. I had been there almost a year. And um, a, a woman had a daycare center in her, her home. She had about eight kids and the chimney collapsed, her chimney collapsed on one of the a three year old. And we got it, um, we got it over the two way and I was sent out and my over enthusiastic news director said, I've got an interview. Be sure to get an interview with the mother. We're gonna be there early. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And I'm, I got, I was so nervous because I, I thought about myself. I didn't have a family yet. I wasn't married, but I said, oh, I don't know if I'm going to do that. So anyway, we got to this, the scene, and we were there before the parents, and the, the paramedics were there, and they were getting ready to bring this little child's body out, and they had taken the other kids aside, and she had been killed from this collapsed chimney, and then I heard someone say, here, comes, here come the parents. And there's no way that I could stick a microphone in either one of their faces. And I didn't. And I wrote my story the way I was going to do it. And it was a tragedy. And apparently my news director found out that I had an opportunity to get in there. Well, 
someone at one of the other stations did stick a microphone in their face and of course they pushed it aside but my news director knew that I was there earlier and didn't, wondered why he didn't see our logo or hear me ask a question and I, I just said I thought I was going to be fired that day I said I, I just didn't think it was the right thing to do I just said it and they, they stopped giving me hard news for a while and then we you know we went full cycle and I did it but I just couldn't do it. I just think there are certain limitations. There's certain things you just don't do that just aren't right, and that was one of them. So what, what could she say? What do we want to hear her cry? Do we want her, her to, to, to mourn on television? You can quietly stand back and you can see the parents go in. But that's what the producers want. That's what I the want news director it. wants, and that's what deep down inside, that, as sick as it is, Nobody can describe their pain worse than the person who's in pain. Right. <coughs> I've found over the years that some loved ones want to talk. Yes. And want I do. The only reason I do is because they, they ran it at my um, send-off at my retirement party. It was, uh, it was a car wash story. <laughs> it was uh, right down the street on City Avenue. There was a new car wash, and I and they they told me to go cover this new car wash. <laughs> so I played the, the song "Car Wash." You know. <laughs> I played the song, and I went up and I interviewed the the employees and had a little fun with it. And they played it at my at my little party. So that was my first story. All right. And the boss's son was there, so I interviewed him, <laughs> his son and wife. But yeah, there are also, yeah, go ahead. I got a quick question. Um, just like, it sounds like you guys been through so much and so many stories, and just having a little one, like I could barely like watch the news sometimes. So right. just alone having to report it and be on the scene, like how do you guys then and now ongoing deal with like, just like keeping that faith or optimistic view of life, um, you know, after so much negative, so negative, yeah. Well, Vernon, Vernon would see firsthand more than me because he was a reporter and covered those stories. And it's different when you're in a studio. You know, it affects you, but not to the degree that it does if you're out there and you're witnessing it. And you know, I, I, I didn't see so much of that in Nashville. I was the education reporter when I came to Philly. It, it, you know, it would get to you. It, it gets to you sometimes. I remember I moved my mom up here when she retired, and I knew it was going to bother her because she came from a little institute, West Virginia, and we'd have maybe one really hard crime story every three weeks or so. If some bootlegger got shot or something like that. <laughs> A mountain goat attack somebody. Right. Yeah. She said, I can't watch your news. How do you how do you deal with your news? It's terrible. And uh, yeah, you know, it's a there's a fine line between you know not reacting to it the way you feel sometimes and becoming numb to it. You know, you you, you don't like when I saw that person delivering the news about the child who was killed, I didn't I didn't want them <coughs> to cry on the air, but I didn't want him to report it like it was like he was doing a city council meeting either. Yeah, you know, like it it, it, it didn't matter. Yeah. It did matter. So just that balance. I wanted to be more careful with the choice of words, and mm -hmm. there's a way to 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 show emotion, show feeling for something, just in your pacing, the way you deliver it. And when you're out there, it's another story, right, Vern? Yeah, I, you develop calluses after a few years when you've been yeah, through things. Have to. And after about three years in Atlanta, I remember my parents came down from Ohio for Thanksgiving. And I had to work that morning, and you know there was the usual. But you hate to say it, and I still get alarmed by the violence, the homicide rate, and all the people getting killed out here every night. It still bothers me tremendously. And uh, to see the loss of family, the loss of life, and the waste of talent out there, and the waste of people who have enormous potential. But after a while, you, you can become very, I don't mean callous, and I always wrote and reported with a certain amount of 
compassion and understanding and things like that. And um, covered many, many stories. Many, many cops and robbers and uh, in courtrooms will keep you on the front page your entire career, which is what I did. Politics and crime were frequently the same thing, so they did all the <laughs> thing. But uh, I remember, I, I could just tell you, the line of demarcation for me, I didn't get married until I was 44, 45, whatever it was. So that, I didn't have any children, I, I've never been married before. And I remember our daughter was born, and uh, I, I covered all kinds of abuse, Every, I've done it all, I've seen it all five times, everything. And, um, you know, uh, I've seen children born by the side of the road in South Africa, starving to death in Ethiopia, but I could go and home at night, and again, my life doesn't always revolve around when the Sixers have a good team, but I can get my little Chinese food, get my little TV table, I was a single man, and I could be remote from it. It didn't keep me up at night worrying about the, the awful things I'd seen or had to cover. And then our daughter was born. And you may, you may not remember the story, but there was a woman in Brewery Town who starved her child to death over a three month period, leaving her down in a basement full of vermin and insects and things like that. And as I sat and covered her trial, normally I would have sat there and I'd have talked about what a tragedy it was. I, I, I don't know if my writing got any better. But I sat there and I stared at this woman. She was a drug addict and she, this was the last child. She'd had a terrible life. And I mean, and, but she starved this little baby over a three and four month period. Rats and roaches. And I, and I went down in that basement. I asked her, I said, man, I mean, and you know, I thought about that little child being starved to death like that. And I saw my daughter's face on her, um, on, you know, happening, something like that could happen to my own right. child. I'm a father at 45, so I'm, and I've seen a lot and been through a lot, so therefore I can really relate to some of life's cruelty on a first-hand yeah. witness basis. And I said, how does somebody do that to their own child, you know? But the woman had a terrible life. She had a, and I, I, I talked to a friend of mine at work about it, a guy named John Rawls, he's one of our, said, she said, I said, man, that was, that was bothering me last night, man. I was sitting through this trial, so everybody was talking about it at work, how awful it was. A lot of women with children work with us. They were talking about how awful it was. And uh, I even cut out, they even made me cut out some of the gorier details about her starvation and her demise. And he said, that's because you used to be remote from it. Now you've got skin in the game. You know, you yeah. can go home and grab your Chinese food and do whatever you're going to do open up your book, your date book, and see what where you were going at night. It didn't, it, but now you've got skin in the game, man. It's no longer something that is remote. You can see and feel all the pain and the tragedy that's here. Did it make me a better reporter? I'm not sure. I, I always wrote, did things with compassion and understanding of the tragedy of the human condition. But it started to affect me after that, you know, and I, and I said, man, this is a, and that's good, I guess. I mean, you need to, before you end your life, you need to understand, but I was always empathetic to the victims, things like that, but my life sort of changed after that. I, could, I felt a little worse yeah. about it. It, it. it had a dent in me, and I, I, don't, I, I don't ever consider myself callous to the point of, uh, but you asked me a question, so. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> That's understandable. It'll be in my book, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and the price will be, I hope, five times more than hers. Because <laughs> so. that'll be inflation by the time I get it done. <laughs> and, uh, yes, sorry. you had a question. So I'm, I'm a teacher. I teach high school. Okay. And so my question to you, I, I'm always looking for they get a lot of educational advice from us, right. which is great. But I, sometimes I think the life advice sinks in a little bit deeper and it helps with the educational piece. Right. Would you have any advice that I could share with my students? High school, I mean, our high school level. Life advice. Life advice. Or just any advice. Yeah. I know, I'm sorry. It's a really big question. <laughs> no, but I'm, no, always, good I'm question. always thinking about that and I'm always 
thinking about how to connect with them right. and to connect with people outside of themselves. And we do a lot of work with that. Um, I teach special. Each of us has a right to a joy that we nurture and sustain from the wellspring of our being. You can't give love until you have love to give. And you only have love to give when you love yourself. Talk to them about learning to internalize that love, to believe in themselves. And you know, in a world, in, in, in the type of world we're living in today, it's hard for kids. I hold my little grandson and he's so innocent and you know he was he was talking babbling like your daughter there the other day and I said oh I I dread the, the day that you come home and say another kid was mean to you or you don't want them to go through any pain or disappointment and inevitably they will but if they learn early I think to internalize that love love of self forgive yourself I remember she talked about it. and when I was sick is when I really took these things to heart. And you know, you, you've learned to forgive yourself because an apology to yourself, I mean, is, is much more than an apology for someone else. You know, no one can give you an Thank apology you. like you can to yourself. Um, I just think that's a start. Belief in self, love of self. Just treat people the way you want to be treated. And I, and I think that goes a long way if you can get them at a point when they're really listening. Yeah, In many cases, yeah. high school might be too late, you know, to catch <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm not giving up. No, I'm not saying, I, no, I'm not saying you should, but the awful stuff that goes on out here all the time and on this, on you know, on that darn cell phone, man, it's the yeah. internet and all the other evil and ignorance on there that's promoted. I just, uh, you know, I know I'm a, a dinosaur, but it, it's frightening what kids have to see yeah. and have, what they have to look at and what they have to see adults do. And, younger, and, and, younger and, and, and um, you know, I, uh, I don't know how, uh, people around here are probably around my age, and you think about the standard of behavior now, compared to what it used to be right. and what it sh and, and uh, these kids are growing up in bad times yes. Yes. shooting yes gun right violence. Oh. do you still meditate oh yes oh yes i still have the tape they gave me at at the mayo clinic and then i've gotten so many more i really swear by meditation you can let yourself it's, it, there's just a way and i sort of had to be i had to be taught how to meditate. You know, I remember I was that A-type personality. You know, not to let the outside cloud you and, you know, just isolate yourself, absorb. Sometimes it's just a sound, the sound of water, a uh, sound of nature. Sometimes it can be music. But I can let go and go somewhere else when I meditate. It's very helpful. Yes, right back there. I just want to say, um, question two. Um, I know I miss seeing you on the news at 11 o'clock because I always made it home in time to <laughs> see you on the news at 11 o'clock. Uh, I was a high school student at one point in my life and I thought I wanted to be a reporter mainly because I saw myself in you. Uh -huh. uh, you came to Channel 6 at the time that I was coming of age, mm -hmm. so you were there every day and it was an inspiration. It's like, I want to do what she does. Right. Do you miss delivering the news to us every day? You know, I've been asked that since I retired. I don't, I'm curious how Vernon is. I do not miss the job. I miss the people. We became so close, and I, I saw that you were up, you were with Nora Rushanik and was at Kathy yeah. the other day yeah. at Broadcast Pioneers. I didn't make that because I had an event, but I keep in touch with the people, and so it really was a good time for me. I I, I don't miss the job anymore. Uh, Thirty-eight years, and that was just in Philly. So I started in college, you know, as a little weather girl. And then I went to Oklahoma and Nashville. So we're talking, you know, well into the 40s, 40 some years. Yes, right back there in the red. Hi. Hi. Um, I can relate to some of you mentioned this or alluded to it, um, but I just would like your opinion on communicators who have to code switch for <coughs> the patient. Um, 
do you consider that an art form, an obligation, something in between, or nothing like that at all? Do I didn't get the I didn't get the whole question. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I, I was just talking about um, some communicators who have to code switch for their occupation. Do you consider that an art form, uh, obligation, um, something in between, or nothing like that at all? Code switch. By that you mean what? Um. <clears throat> Your TV voice versus your at Uncle Bobby's voice versus at the barbecue voice. Versus oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, you know. You're asking if she's at the barbecue laughing <laughs> like it's the old days in West Virginia or yeah. the old days for me in Atlanta versus being out in this environment. You know. I you know, I had a I had a thick Appalachian accent. And I guess, you know, colloquially, I, 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 I spoke like my friends. Um, I had this little broadcast voice when I was down in West Virginia, but I guess I didn't talk. My dialect wasn't as universal as some management would have liked when I first came here. So they, uh, one of the things they did was they, they, um, they got me a voice coach. I remember her name, she was wonderful. Her name was Julia Wing, she was from Temple, Dr. Julia Wing. And I looked her up years later, because when she came in, she made me feel so good, because she said, they got, they want me to help you speak less like you're from West Virginia, but I'm telling you, there's some people who need me worse than you do, <laughs> that I should be working with here. And, but, but she, she was feisty, but she taught me how to speak from my diaphragm. She did help me <coughs> because I didn't know any other way to speak. You know, I felt that if I tried to speak um, so-called properly, I, I would sound phony. But when she, when I learned to speak from my diaphragm, then I developed a more universal dialect. Now, when my brothers would come up from West Virginia, <laughs> two of them moved to Dallas, Texas, so they got a whole another accent. <laughs> And when, they, when I would be around them over the holidays and I'd come back and people would say, oh, you've been around your family, haven't you? Because it would creep back, you know, some of it would come back. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's part of what you mean, but you also mean when you're around your friends and, and, and you're not in a professional... I, I guess my, my friends became more professional. The friends that I had here. But Are you saying you were country? Is that what you're trying country. to say? <laughs> I was country. I was as country well, as they get. Well, I was a little West really, Virginia no, country not girl. Really, not really. I don't. Not you don't really. consider that when when you first met me, didn't you think I was a little country? <laughs> it's been a long time. It's been 42 years. It's been a long time. And I've known you through so many phases of yeah. life that it's hard for me to remember. I, but back I, then, I think I did have my on-air voice because I would be acceptable on air it, when, in a story, in a report. I think when it, it got to the when I started anchoring. That's when more of the Appalachian accent would come out. I didn't hear it. That's oh, interesting. I didn't hear it. Did you I know remember, they got me a voice coach? I remember she, I knew that, but yeah. I, I, I just remember the dandelion she used to put in her hair. That's what kept me. <laughs> I didn't think about the voice. I'm, I'm kidding, obviously, I'm joking. But uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's just been so long, I can't. It's funny you say that, though, because it. my daughter in law just took. Um, her child, my grandson, to Florida to be with her people in Winter Haven. And her mother and her Auntie Bob, and they all have pretty thick uh, Floridian accents. And so she has this little life cake thing where we can all see the videos that she does with the baby. And on one of them, oh, she says, well, I, I, I put Will in the water today, and I, he was playing in the water. I said, what is Esther doing? She really reverted back to the way, you know, her mother and her aunt and everyone speak. And she wouldn't believe it when she came home two days later and she's talking very professionally. She has a PhD and she teaches. She's a professor at Villanova. And I said, Esther, I couldn't believe it was you. You know, but she did sort of revert back. So I'm sure people have issues with that that, you know, you want to feel at home, you want to feel like you're with your loved ones and be accepted mm -hmm. the way you were as family. 
And she was able to do that and then come right out of it when she came back to yeah. Philadelphia. Yeah. But I think for a while I used to have a broadcast voice and then I would just be casual, loose. So not, not after about 10 years or so. So, Did you ever talk like you were from Atlanta? Did you ever talk? Well, I grew, I, but I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Ohio. And uh, I, I don't like know you. that I did. I, I don't know. Sometimes when I go down to visit, I went to college there and lived there for a long time before I came here. And sometimes I, uh, when I talk to my friends down there, I, I sort of fall back into the dialect and 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 uh right. it's actually sort of comfortable and fun you know yeah uh, i was down uh, <laughs> it, but this is the way i normally talk i mean i don't i don't think i'm any different do I? Mm -hmm. but okay. sometimes i fall back into the lineup into the into the into the dialect just because i like the dialect those were great days when i was you know 21 yeah. and 22 and and right. sort of and do around town, and it, it, it's fun. And a lot of my friends who are still Southerners, uh, still there, you know, I, I, you sort of fall back into it if you're down home, you know, if you're home. And, right. uh, I, but I, uh, that's interesting. But I talk, I don't, do I seem to be any different from what you're <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but, uh, 858. Do you think about one more question? Huh? Oh. One more question? Yeah. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. So, one more quick one? Okay. Go ahead. This question is for Vernon. Is there any reason that you never came into the studio and continue to report uh, from the streets? Well, a lot goes into that. You know, I. I there's a certain amount of charm that an anchor person who's on there for hours at a time has to have. <laughs> and, uh, no, 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 there's an art form to it. Okay. And sometimes two or three minutes of me is enough for most people. You know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, they like somebody who's a bit more charming and less blunt and direct and things like that. So I'm probably not cut out for it, you know. I could do it. I did it in Atlanta, but um, for seven years before I came here, but you know you got to be able to fit the mold. You know you got to have the breathing right and things like that. And I'm just not as I don't want to take a lot of time up with a lot of stories I can. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, there's a lot of terrible things going on out here in the world, and I'm not interested in the 120 foot long hoagie sandwich that one of us put out there. I'm just not down with that. <laughs> you know I'm not going to sit there and act like I'm down with that. You know right. I'm far more concerned about other things, and that's. And there's an art form. I mean, it, it, it's 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 performance art, and um, you do find people who are very different in person than they are on television, and uh, it's very strange. You know, people. I, I'm relatively quiet. You know, I seem boisterous and things like that, but I'm actually very shy and bashful. Now you overcome that by you know experience and things like that, but I don't have a whole whole lot to say. To the general uh, public out there, you know, and um, you know, and I, I don't have a whole lot of rap, you know, and I so it depends on who you are. You got to learn how to be content with yourself, as Lisa says, and be who you are. She's a lovely person, you know. I'm not necessarily that, you know, and that, uh, and I don't, you know, I, I it's just that, you know. <laughs> You walk down the street, people start telling you their problems or things like that. And um, people, my father used to have a saying, he said, son, remember something, familiarity breeds contempt. You know, and and these folks don't tell me, they don't know it, my, my personal life or if I'm in a bad mood or whatever. I'm always professional, I'm always nice to people as long as they're nice to me and don't loud talk me. You know, I mean, it just, uh, you know, I could tell you some horror stories about people who familiarity breeds contempt, you know, and uh, there's certain things you don't say to me. And one time I, I, I won't get into it. <laughs> I, I, you know, but I think I'm the same person now that I always was. I don't like to put, I don't put on airs or anything, and I try to be straightforward and direct and concise. And, uh, I don't know. It's uh, what do you, you 
You'd have to judge that on your own. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I can't look from outside in. Well, we found you pretty charming for this last two hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, I am. I, I really am so. A nice guy, but I, you know.